everything that everybody in the world of electronic music's going through right now, um, in some shape or form, I think you've probably been through before. So um, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. So f firstly, you, you managed U2 for 30 years. Um, and as well Actually, 35. 35 years. Um, so f firstly, what's the key to maintaining a successful relationship um, with your artists for such a long time? Because well, you had a pretty unique deal, I think, at the beginning. Um, very important to get the right client. I mean, that's the key to success, really. Talent and ambition and youth. Um, I had managed one other band, and they were my age, so they were 25, and they were too old to make it. Um, they had wives and commitments. So the next band I managed was U2, and they were 17, and that was in 1978. It took us two years to get a record deal, which was surprisingly hard. Um, I was not musical enough to, to detect that one of the reasons we weren't getting signed was that they couldn't really play. <laughs> and, um, um, but they could, they could kind of write songs, or they could write songs that sounded like the, Maron, the, the Ramones. And um, we eventually got signed by the only label that wanted us, which was Island which turned out to be uh, a bit of luck. And you, but you, uh, you're often referred to as almost the fifth member of you too. Did you, did you, did you struck a very, you were, you, were, you were equal share at the start, well, I believe. Well, that was always spoken about and written, um, that I was, I was uh, uh, that that was the case. I resisted that. I always preferred to speak of them as my clients. Um, we were not partners. I was responsible to them, as it happens, um, in, the, in the early days, you know, there were four of them and one of me. So the commission basically made it um, uh, look like we were equal partners. But in fact, my commission was reduced later on. You, you took a couple of, um, kind of looking back, quite um, well, looked look like very smart decisions in the early days. One, one was you had a particular attitude about finding your own audience. You didn't do what every other rock and roll band did and, and go on the support circuit. Well, we, we hated opening for other, other bands because in those days, um, it was, I mean, I remember an, a really unpleasant gig where you two opened for the Stranglers and the Stranglers treated them like shit. And they said, let's not do that anymore. So we really tried to avoid those situations where um, the gig was not in, out of our control. We decided, we decided really that it was better to play to 50 people who'd come to see us rather than a thousand people who'd come to see somebody else on the off chance that they might like us. He'd be good at DC 10. <laughs> um, and the other, the, other, well, the other thing that you did is you, you, you were probably one of the first bands at that time to really kind of understand how to break America and make a commitment to America. Do you want to just talk about that? Yeah, well, um, of course, coming from Ireland, uh, London beckoned and the enormous influence on music of the Inkies, the, the English weekly music press, affected you two um, very much in the early days. But we did not regard London as the gateway to the world. Um, we kind of intuitively understood that if we wanted to be a world-beating rock and roll band, that would have to be in America. So we were playing gigs in America even before the first album came out in 1980 and went on to break America by playing live. Um, we didn't... You obviously can't have been making money at those times. You must have been no, paying we to were, go. No, we were... Um, there was considerable tour support required, which we actually got from uh, Seymour Stein's company, Warner Brothers. Is Seymour here? Um, you will be later. Well, Seymour's boss in those days um, was Mo Austin, and um, he used to give us the money. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of money. We could do a three-month tour of the U.S. for like 70 grand. I mean... 17 or... 7-0. 7 -0, right. And you got that money from someone you didn't even sign to, or did they license? They were the licensee for okay. Ireland in America. Okay. Um, so coming right up to date, what was the decision 
um, to step, you know, have, you've stepped back now for management. So tell us about why that happened and how that's happened now and, and bringing in um, Gaia Siri, better known as Madonna's manager. Well, it had quite a lot to do with, um, I mean, it was something we'd always planned to do. From the early days when we had the same uh, not very good deals as everyone else in publishing and recording, we, we clawed back those rights over the years as the band became successful. Every time we extended, we made, <clears throat> we made the deal better. And eventually, in, in return for continuing the uh, record deal, Ireland had to give up the, all the publishing, which uh, previous and subsequent. Um, later on, we, we actually became part owners of Island Records because they were unable to pay us our royalties in the mid-80s, so we took 10% of the company um, instead. No, it wasn't, it wasn't but you were very loyal to Island, though, right? Yeah, Which we is were, another thing. Uh, we were loyal, but it was, it was, a, it was a, 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 a tough relationship. It wasn't any fun telling my clients that their record label were unable to pay them their royalties. Um, anyway, we took part ownership of Island so when Ireland was sold to Polygram around about uh, 1990, um, we benefited from that transaction. It looked like a smart thing to do then. <laughs> it looked like a very smart thing to do, yeah. Okay. Um, but, but so tell us what's happened now. You've, well, your your principal now, management... What's happened now is that over the years we, we acquired or reacquired the rights to every song they'd ever written and every master they'd ever made. And a small percentage of that was me, or principal management. And what happened recently is that the band bought the management company, which contained those rights. So they now have um, 100%. And who, who manages the band day to day? Well, day to day, it's Guy Osiri um, out of Los Angeles. But several of my staff um, stayed with the band, um, Brian Seller. Karen Kaplan, um, um, th those people basically. And you, and you remain involved as a kind of oversee? I would say I'm lurking in the background if anyone, if anyone wants my opinion about something. Yeah, they so want to know where the trucks are parked, they call you. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a lot of trucks. Um, and Live Nation are involved in that whole setup as well. Well, Live Nation were very helpful because they financed the transaction and um, um, so, and they, they also own Gaia Series Company. Um, so, yeah, they're very helpful. We have a very good relationship with Live Nation. Okay. You, you, you've been stressing to me over the last couple of days that you know nothing about this world, but, you know, you were, you were ahead of the game in terms of involving DJs um, with the band. Paul Oakenfold did some pretty groundbreaking remixes, um, and you, you actually took him on tour. As, well, a, as a warm-up DJ, which was unheard of. Well, it was a lot of fun. We, we were doing what was, at the time, the groundbreaking vi video-incorporated production. These great screens had just come out um, in 1990. Um, Philips actually made them, and we thought, naively, that because Philips owned Polygram, they would see the opportunity to display their hardware and they might give it to us free, but uh, they made us pay, <laughs> which was extraordinary. But the Zoo TV production, which was driven by laser discs, you remember laser discs? Yeah. That's what we stored the material on. That show had flying cars and big screens and Paul Oakenfold um, sitting in a Trabant, I think. That was his DJ booth. Absolutely. And he was a great part of the tour. And uh, he, was, he was like you too, in a way. He was, he was very ambitious. Um, he was one of the first, if you like, known branded DJs of whom there are now so many. Um, none is, not, not, no, but he also he, provided probably one of the most iconic, or the first ever DJ photograph of DJing in a stadium, which is in Paul's book, actually, which is him with his arms out, very Bono-like, 
um, I think it was at Wembley Stadium, with, with obviously the stadium, which is now a very common photo, but it was separate, I'm absolutely sure it was the first time it had ever been taken of a DJ, and that was on stage with you, so. It was really great having Oki on tour, because apart from anything else, I mean, he was, he was doing remixes for the band, kind of on the trot during the tour, as well as doing his own show every night. Um, but on, on top of that, um, he was kind of keeping them in touch with, um, with another world of music. I was going to say, that, that was also the very much the first boom of electronic music, the first time ele electronic music, dance music, really kind of made a massive impact in the mainstream. Was there ever a temptation back then for, for you to, to do a dance album, to get Paul to produce? <laughs> well, they, they, you may recall they did one, um, and it was called Pop, which was... Um, um, not their most successful record. <laughs> and I, it's, clearly, it's clearly vanished from your memory. Yeah. I, I wish, Sorry. I wish, it, I wish it would vanish from my memory. So, <laughs> so you fought them over that a little bit. <laughs> um, and Nelly Hoople, you got involved as well, I remember. We, we, can't, we can't find him now, but he was, he was involved. Um, I know you, you're fascinated as well about um, you know, DJs now turning up with uh, with a with a USB stick, and I don't know if Paul Paul did this book with the band called From the Ground Up, which is a, a, a kind of a, a diary of the 360 tour. Which in, can you just tell us about a bit about the scale of that, well, and you know what, was, what you're witnessing today? It was um, it was extremely ambitious. Uh, technically, um, we had always wanted to play in stadiums the way we play in arenas, um, i.e. Th with people all around, 360 degrees. But there's no way of doing that in a stadium because there's nothing to hang the lighting and the video and the uh, audio equipment from. So we built this thing that looks a bit like that structure in LAX. Um, and that had, even though it was incredibly expensive, and we had to build three of them. Um, it meant that we increased the capacity of each stadium to, well, by, by roughly 20%. So you'd take a 50,000 seater and you'd be able to get 75,000 people in. Now we would have looked very foolish if those, uh, uh, that extra 20% had not turned up, but luckily they did and um, we seemed to get the pricing right the tour grossed three quarters of a billion dollars over 110 shows. I think those were the numbers. And the ticket, ticket price roughly $110. Um, it was so expensive to mount that production. There were 400 people traveling. Mind you, 200 of them were drivers. Um, and it was really frightening to wake up each day and know that whether we played or not, we were gonna spend another three quarters of a million dollars. But it was the greatest production of all time, and I don't think anyone will ever beat those gross numbers. I was gonna say we were wowed by some numbers at the start of the conference about how big EDM is now, or the, the, the market value, but you were, I think you managed to play to seven, eight million people on that tour. But seven and a quarter million, something like that, 7.2 million. With the comps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were no comps. No every, every ticket has to be paid for at a U2 show. Whether it's my guest or Bono's guest, every ticket is paid for. Right. And, the, but, and, the, and the other thing about this tour was, it wasn't just these guys driving around. You actually had three, the production was repeated, what, how many times? Three, there were three versions of it, and they were built in Belgium, which is, as you may know, has become the center of the production industry. It is for, yeah, tomorrow, for, for the electronic scene as well. Because all the clever video guys, all the clever steel guys, they're all in Belgium. So whenever there was a football match or a pub quiz or anything like that on the tour, it was always the Belgians versus the rest. What, any particular highs and lows of, of your time with you two? Um, that's the really stand out in your memory that you're... you're, you're well, I think... The, the scariest moment maybe first. Well, the scariest moment was before we actually saw it work. Um, and when we built it for the first time, 
in the new camp in Barcelona, that one, which is the best football stadium. I but it's also the best, it's the best rock and roll stadium because unlike other stadiums like Wembley, there's no running track. So the seats are all closer to the stage and to the field. And it takes 90,000 people. And it's, it's a wonderful place. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say it's since emerged that it's made pretty well entirely out of asbestos. So um, beware. Not good for the Barcelona fans. But you, because um, you had a moment where you had to pull Glastonbury on that tour, and it cost you a, a and then you had to go back and do Glastonbury. Yeah, we had to pull Glastonbury after uh, Bono had, had, um, had back surgery and we postponed it for a year and went back from the American tour to do it and then picked up the American dates. So that was costly. And in the end, I, don't, I would have to say it wasn't one of the best shows, but um, we were determined to do Glastonbury anyway. I don't but know no, I nobody really gets paid a lot of money for doing Glastonbury, but you paid to do it, basically. Yeah. A couple of million. <laughs> And, and, and moments you're most proud of, or looking back? Well, I suppose the, the, the best of all was when it worked, and we saw what a spectacular piece of engineering, plus great songs, plus great performances, can do for you. You two having, you know, only four members, um, I remember in the very early days when um, <coughs> we were um, in the studio doing, doing a forget what album, and Edge was starting to turn into a multi-instrumentalist and he was playing things with his feet, he was playing keyboards and um, I said, does this mean we're gonna need another player? And there was a moment of truth and they said, no, no, this is a four-man band, we'll use every piece of technology there is to augment that. They've never been afraid of uh, of, of, um, <coughs> of science, um, but there was never going to be another individual on the stage. And um, I think that's kind of what people want from a rock and roll band. They don't want to see, you know, backing section horns and uh, backing singers. I think you touch on technology there. You were one of the first bands also, which you, you got a bit of a kicking from at the time from the likes of the enemy to actually really engage with brands. Do you want to, well, um, with Blackberry, with... Well, we, the first one was with, with Apple in 2005. And Apple were running the most stylish um, advertising anyway for the iPod. Um, and for the first time, we decided to put music into an advertising campaign. And that, um, we made the commercial with a video director, Mark Romanek. Um, and f it, was, it was such a success in research because they don't play those ads unless um, the audience research is positive. Apple ended up spending $30 million around the world on that ad, which had the effect of giving you two um, a pop hit, or if, as if they'd had a pop hit on radio, which they never do. I mean, they never have hit singles. Um, but that was the equivalent of a hit single. It took, it took you into the world of Apple. How, how did you deal with Steve Jobs on first hand? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know him, or I didn't know him as well as Bono got to know him very well. Um, he was very smart, um, very into music. Um, and what was happening simultaneously with that iPod um, commercial was iTunes, which... Um, which seemed at the time to be the penicillin, Jimmy Iovine, I remember, called it. He said, this is, this is it, this is the penicillin, this is gonna save us from uh, file sharing. I think the world, you know, the world's moved on a bit since then, and <clears throat> iTunes, um, you know, uh, downloads obviously are not as important as streaming is gonna be, and is now really, and so I think a very significant transaction recently was Apple purchasing Beats. I don't think um, I don't think they were buying Beats uh, for the headphones, um, but they were certainly buying Beats for for the music service, the streaming service, um, which uh, that will be the future of Apple. 
music distribution, and I would not be surprised that there's been some speculation in, in, in the blogosphere the last few, few days that um, Jimmy Iovine is likely to become the head of content um, for Apple generally. As some, as no one knows Jimmy better than you. How do you think he'll fare inside a technology company like that? I think, I think Jimmy will do, will do very well. He's extremely smart. Um, always has his eye on the future. Very, very ambitious. Um, he's not particularly uh, techy, um, and I suspect neither is Dre, but, um, but he can see the way um, that um, public taste is drifting. And um, <clears throat> he's always, you know, when, he, when he's producing records, when he was producing records for you too, um, he, he was notorious in that he was always on the phone. So how could he be listening to I the music? I remember a few times I was in a studio with him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, though, he is the gateway to kind of pushing the rest of the industry and probably bands like you too over the edge in terms of their attitude to streaming and what it's going to mean in terms of the way you're remunerated for that service? Yeah. And what, what's your parting stance with you two, you know, over the last couple of years about streaming? Well, um, in many ways, we were fortunate enough to have... Uh, future proofed the band because our long term licensing deals with Universal, where we license both the masters and the songs to Universal Music Publishing, they were negotiated so long ago that um, the advances um, were very substantial. Um, those sort of advances would probably not be achievable in a deal to be done now. But I think, you know, I mean, the sums of money that percolate through to artists from Spotify are so trivial that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to see why you should give a new record to Spotify immediately. Um, you can, um, you, I think they're more, more of a promotional medium. If it was a new act, um, there'd be no reason not to give it to Spotify. But for established acts that are actually going to sell a number of records, um, I think Spotify should be, you know, a, a later window in an album release schedule. Just, just my opinion. But as you know, the world moves so fast. I mean, just me being, residing in LA now, where you see it's so common that um, people get in their car and the, the connections are so fast, they just, they just stream. It's like radio yeah. or streaming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's already happened. It's, it's, it's in the part, you know. So it's um, then it's annoying that you can't get the Coldplay record the day it comes out. Well, <laughs> well, I suppose it, you can still buy it. But, it might prompt you to go and buy it. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> well, I think you would. I don't. Yeah. I think. I think just it's obviously just paying for the streaming service. That's the the, the trick, isn't it? Well, you know, people people have to get paid. Otherwise, there isn't going to be any music. Um, it can't become a, a sort of an amateur sport. Um, and um, I think there's a lot that, you know, there are some vested interests who could help a lot more than they are doing. I mean, clearly, uh, Google is the greatest uh, theft enabler um, on the internet. Um, With through YouTube or through just... Well, YouTube, funnily enough, is, 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 a, is a sort of different beast. YouTube is clearly the future of distribution, and, and I kind of love YouTube. But when I Google YouTube music, um, there are multiple opportunities to steal it. And I don't think um, we any longer take, I don't think the industry any longer takes sincerely the, their promises to take things down when they get a notice. They, they take them down, but the bots replace them immediately. I don't think it's beyond the ingenuity of all those clever people in Google to deal with that, but I don't think they want to. Would you, would you sit down with the band and is, would, it, would these concerns rest with you or would Bono come to you? Because you've been, like, as technology's changed, uh, every, um, you know, every, every, every Every major change point, I guess, in the last 20 years, you, you've been at the forefront of it because you're the most likely people to lose or gain from it. Well, yes, that, that's true. But the band are far more te technically adept than I am. Um, 
and indeed because they're in the studio all the time using uh, new forms of technology, um, that, no, they're much, much more fluent than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm bluffing. <laughs> um, another, th just, just back onto the production, what do you, what do you make now of um, what's going on in the electronic space with the, the kind of rise of, suddenly DJs are running around having the kind of same arms races as maybe you were? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's funny you use that expression, arms race. I remember Mick Jagger coming to see the U2 Zoo TV production, and he was standing beside me, and, he's, and he said, fuck, he said, what did this cost? He said, he said, now that you've done this, what are we gonna have to spend on the next one? So there is an, a bit of an arms race, and it's not surprising, because um, the technology is there to make the audience's experience so much better. In those days, I mean, in the 80s, when, before there was video, people still went to see bands in stadiums. They couldn't see anything. Um, and when video came through for a while, it was uncool for rock and roll bands to use video reinforcement. Um, in the same way as rock and roll bands, some of them, Bruce Springsteen wouldn't make videos, that kind of thing. Um, we were a bit different in that we always embraced the technology and tried to get hold of it first and use it best. And I think what's happening in your culture is now that these um, massive <clears throat> dance music festivals around the world um, are being mixed up with performed mu live music, rock and roll music, um, the audience expectation of a show um, should, should not be resisted. Um, I think it's part of modern show business, and we're all in show business, um, to do a great show. And in the same way as if you turn up at a regular, say, a rock and roll concert in an arena, um, or even a theater nowadays, and there's no video reinforcement. I think you're entitled to think that uh, you've been slightly shortchanged. And I, I would expect that that arms race, as you describe it, um, is going to become as significant as it has already become, I think, part of your yeah, I culture. Think it's, yeah, maybe it's, it's already gone beyond the artists themselves. It's, it'll be between the festivals in terms of who can get. I always got the impression with you too that you'd probably sit down when you're planning one of these tours and. As you say, you'd, you'd probably have people coming to you showing you the latest gadgets and... Well, that, that certainly happened. But, but what, we always, what we always tried to do, and what was, as, as we became more successful and we were able to take more control, we were no longer at the mercy of festival promoters who would, who would hire a, a crap PA and, um, and, and, and not pay much money for the lighting rig. At least we were in charge of it. it we could guarantee how good it was going to be, and it was going to be consistent. And I know um, anecdotally that in the culture of uh, dance music festivals, some of the promoters um, take those responsibilities seriously. Some of them uh, cut corners. There's enormous variation in the production standards at dance music festivals. And of course, there's enormous variation country by country, uh, state by state in the US, city by city, in the way that the authorities treat medical questions and legal questions. And that variation um, is obviously a characteristic of an industry where festivals are so profitable um, and you know the brand of the festival um, is the thing that the audience recognize primarily. And I'm, I'm, one of the things I'm fascinated by attending this, um, this convention is trying to figure out how you're all going to deal with that in the future. I think, I think the days of the, 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 the illegal raves in the 80s, that we, we had those issues, but I don't think it really happens as much anymore, especially now, which brings us to my next point with you know, major venture capital you know, coming into our, our world um, and, and rolling up businesses. I mean, you were very much in the, in the middle of that storm 
when it happened to Live Nation the first time around. What do you, what do you think now, now at SFX is a great example of, um, do, do you think this is a good thing for the electronic space, a bad thing? What are the, what are the things to watch out for? I, I, I really don't know enough about it to answer that, but what I do know from my own experience is that these giant U2 tours cost so much to, to mount, we could never have done that without a, an investor. And in our case, it was, it was Live Nation who were partners in, in all those tours. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure what I, well, I'm not sure how to answer your question because though it is quite clear to the, the, the broader music world that, that EDM, is it, is it impolite to, call, to generalize it as EDM? Uh, half but, the room it is, the other <laughs> half is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Depends on where you're from. Well, um, I don't know the codes, but... Um, well, here, here put, it, put it another way. You were there when... I mean, some of the concern about SFX would be that they're just coming in to roll up these businesses, ramp up the value, and offload it again. Therefore, how concerned will they be about what they're doing while they, they're holding everything together? Um, you you kind of went through that experience. You were there when when well um, bef you know bef you were well, working the, with the promoters when they were gathered. Le well, but let me let me answer it this way. In the in the eighties, when we started doing international touring with you two, um, we had a brilliant agent who's actually here in the room, Ian, Ian Flukes, um, who now uh, runs Mixmag. Um, but Ian. Um, and I used to choose the promoters around Europe, even the venues, by traveling around Europe ourselves. Um, we never, we were never stiffed. We all, we got paid every single time. I think one of the things that um, that SFX um, and Live Nation and the other corporate entities will at least guarantee is that people are going to get paid and that festivals are not going to go bust. And that's pretty important um, because there are a lot of livelihoods involved in these big events. Okay. As, as a bit of fun to end before I hand over for some questions, I just thought I'd ask you, I mean, one of the things, you know, if you, if you kind of watch the Saturday night live version of how mad it's getting in the world of EDM and, and these DJs getting so famous, um, the temptation for the EDM musical on Broadway can, cannot be far away, you know, a night with Tiesto or Avicii or David Guetta. So what would your advice be on, on heading into Broadway, having done it so brilliantly with Spider-Man? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, Spider-Man was, was um, um, I mean, it, it, there were parts of it that were fun, but generally it was a financial disaster. and. Um, starting in the early stages when the original producer actually dropped dead in the course of a meeting with me and Edge. Really? <laughs> that, that should have been a sign. <laughs> and we, we, we used, when we'd got over the shock and, and started a few months later, we used to, we used to joke that Edge had negotiated him to death. Um, <laughs> But, but um, later on, <coughs> uh, Michael Cole took over as the producer, um, and um, he, he, I mean, he fought a very good fight, and he raised the rest of the money, but it, it did cost a ridiculous amount of money. And Broadway, um, if you, if you uh, don't know this already, is a different world. It's, it's not like... So I was thinking with you, you could have gone to Vegas would have been the obvious choice, but you well, went fun, to the funnily very enough, Funnily enough, that is the current plan for Spider-Man to resurface in, in Vegas. Um, and could, be, could be at Hard Rock or something. With so what, watch <laughs> that space. Okay. Uh, Paul McGuinness, thank you very much. I think... <laughs> we got five minutes for some questions from the floor, so... Hi, Bill from Ibiza. Paul, I believe you named your company um, Principled Management because your belief was that management in the industry at that time was pretty unprincipled. Have you seen much over the following 35 years to make you change that opinion at all? Um, I think <clears throat> the 
industry has an ill-deserved reputation for sharp practice. I, I certainly um, have met um, many, many honorable people, in fact, nearly all of them, um, and it's quite surprising that um, you can do, or I have certainly done, very substantial agreements on the basis of a handshake, and, um, <clears throat> and the deal has started to operate before the lawyers caught up. So I'm not as, I'm not as, um, I'm not as, as black about that um, aspect of the business. I know that is for outsiders, the industry, the industry's reputation. And I don't know whether this world that you're all in is any different. Um, I'm sure everyone's completely honest. Another question? You can always step up the front here as well. One there. Hi, I'm Dylan. Uh, I was wondering at what point do you think um, artists should go get management, especially for the DJs here? A lot of people have, have come up to me asking, Ooh, where should I look for management, this, that, the other? And uh, I, I've pointed them in some direction, but they want someone who's young, their age, who can help them do it together, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I'm, that's sort of what we did, and I recommend it. I mean, I didn't have any qualifications apart from, um, if you like, ambition. And when the debate um, comes up, as it regularly does, sort of indie versus major, um, I, always, um, I always say that the majors surprisingly to many people, are there to be um, infiltrated and um, used. They, they really want smart young people who understand the culture to come in and tell them what to do. And if they think they know, if they think you know what you're doing, if, if they think you know what you're doing, they will give you the keys to the car and not everyone realizes that, and there's a lot of um, needless uh, cynicism, in my view. Good question. <coughs> One more over here. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Jones from All of Sound. Um, I'd just like to ask you one question. Have you ever heard of RDM? R-E-M? RDM. RDM. Uh, no. It's Rocktronic Dance Music. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. I'd sorry. I'd just like to know your view on the combination of guitars and electronics. Because obviously certain artists have been doing that for a long time and in certain places like America it was never recognized as proper music. But now because of the EDM explosion, people are actually recognizing those bands that combine those music. It, it, it's the first time I've heard the acronym, but I, there are probably... Yeah, I've, I just invented it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, that explains it. I, I, I probably know artists, or I will, would recognize artists who you would include in that genre description. Okay. Any more questions? That's it. Thank you very much, Paul McGuinness.